good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for taking some of your valuable time to join me today. Today is one of the more important interviews I'm ever gonna do. I'm very excited to do this interview. And that's because it contains a message that is a similar sort of message to what I got. Um, I'm joined today by uh, Desta Barnaby, who is um, the person who produces all this, and there would be no YouTube channel if it weren't for Desta. And um, we actually have a, um, an interview that we just did with Desta on my Grant Cameron uh, White House UFO YouTube channel. And uh, she was very articulate. We get into channeling. It's one of the better interviews that's up there. And I'm also joined by Sinead Wellahan from Toronto, who's um, my um, co-interviewer. And she's also sort of like a research partner with me now. How are you doing, Sinead? Doing very well, and I'm very glad to be here, and uh, very much looking forward to talking to Sherry and hearing her story. It sounds really fascinating. It is a fascinating story. Uh, but most people who um, have heard me rant and rave for the last couple of years know that I always sort of try to end my um, my lectures and my um, interviews with a a certain thing that I was sort of uh, given. And that is sort of my own theory of wow, where um, I, had a, I had a noetic experience in 2017 where basically um, I was given 24 different things. And it was, is it this, or is it this, is it this, or is it this? And you're making the wrong assumption. It's this, it's, it's not that, it's the other thing. It's completely opposite. And the one that, that applies to tonight's interview is they said to me, is it one life or is it multiple lives? If it's one life, then it's one world and it has certain rules. But if it's multiple lives, if you live multiple lives, it's a whole different world and all the rules change. And people who know me know that I also, am, I, I, I maintain I'm the biggest promoter of Michael Newton in the world. I, am, I saw him lecture at a UFO conference. My life was absolutely shifted around. And Michael Newton did 7,000 regressions of uh, people. He was a clinical psychologist. And what he would do is he'd take a person into the past life he would let them die in the past life and take them into the spirit world. And this is something that Desta, for anybody who wants to do this, Desta does this kind of stuff, this kind of regression stuff. So Michael Newton would take them into the spirit world. And what the 7,000 people, according to Newton, said that when we die, we go in front of a council. And in, in the council, there's between three and 12 people. And the middle guy, they're all wearing robes. And the guy in the middle has a... Uh, a medal around his, uh, hanging off his, a medallion hanging from his, his neck. It's a gold medallion about the size of an orange, and it has like alien writing around the edge of the medallion, and in the middle has a symbol that is specific to the person who's getting life review. And the way it was pointed out was that we do our own life review, and you only get asked one question, and the question is, how did it work out? Five-word question, how did it work out? And according to Newton, all 7,000 people basically gave the same answer. I could have done better. And what happens is that we come into the, if it's a multiple life world, there's no doubt to me that we come in with certain agreements, that we promise that we're going to do this, we're going to try that, we're going to change this, we're going to correct that. And then we come in and we come out the other end and that's why they say I could have done better. I forgot. I was going to do that, but I forgot to do it. I got down the wrong road and I didn't do it. And so... The reason this is important is that my guest tonight is Sherry Wild, and I was uh, people who have heard me lecture know that I talk about Sherry all the time in my lectures because she says some very important things. And I'm honored that she would join us tonight. Her book is called The For Forgotten Promise. I was going to show a copy of it, but I think I lent it to my sister, and she uh, did not return it to me. So I've got autographed copy, but I think everybody should buy it. It's an extremely important book, and as we'll get into. It is actually now going to be um, be appearing on TV, it, and it's an extremely important story. So I want to welcome Sherry Wild. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good tonight. Thank you. Nice to be Beautiful. here. Beautiful. I, I really I really appreciate your being on. So can we start with um, you? You've got a long story, as you said. Um, it's going to be uh, a number of episodes on TV if it if it goes through. You've got a long story. Can you start for me, for, for the, maybe the uh, dozen people who don't know sort of the basics of your story, what, how did you get dragged into this and how, what was this thing about the promise where uh, you were pulled into this uh, by Da and um, the, the other people that you were involved with? 
the other guys, yeah. So yeah, so what is the forgotten promise? Basically, the name of the book is The Forgotten Promise and people ask me, what is the forgotten promise? The promise that I forgot until I was um, in my late 30s was that I promised to come in and work on behalf of um, planet Earth, Mother Earth, as she um, ascended to the higher dimensions during this time of, of um, the Great Awakening, or as my guys call it, the uh, Great Earth Changes. So my story starts before I came here because I have memory of who I was before I came here. I was hanging out in the, in the ethers or in some other dimension or something when um, the call went out that, that Earth, planet Earth was in need of, of assistance. That, um, and everyone knows about planet Earth. All, we all knew about planet Earth and what had gone on with her, how she had held back her evolution uh, for waiting for her children to awaken. Planet Earth was a planet that was um, a planet of duality and is a planet of duality. And so there's conflict and contrast on the planet. And dark forces had taken control of the planet to a large extent and humanity had gotten caught up in a cycle of, of karma, of, of just being recycled over and over on the planet. The humans on this planet live short lives and they just get recycled. They just have to continually come back. So they never had much of a shot at waking up and, and breaking free of the control system and, and realizing the truth of who they, who they really are. They were made to believe that they were small and powerless and that they um, were at the mercy of everything, you know, and had no real power within themselves. So here it comes to where the great cycle is coming through again and, the, and Mother Earth has a chance to go from third dimension up to fourth and into fifth dimension. And her children are um, out of control, kind of, they're not evolving as they should, although it's, it's not, well, it is kind of dire actually. But um, in 1945, when the um, nuclear bomb, when the atom bomb was detonated, they um, put out the call because humanity was on a path, a trajectory to where they were going to destroy the planet. And that could not be allowed to happen again. So they asked for volunteers to come in because there's the rule of non-interference. You can't go on to another planet and, and meddle in a, a race's evolution. So the call went out to uh, try to come up with a plan. And what they came up with was pretty smart. It was that they would call in volunteers from throughout the other dimensions, throughout the universes, and higher frequency beings would birth onto the planet, actually step down their frequency and come into a third dimensional planet and, and live their lives here. And it was hoped that they would remember the truth of who they are and also that they would just re be at a higher frequency, even though they were in a, on a third dimensional planet, coming in, being awakened souls, they would just naturally be of a higher frequency. So many of the volunteers, there are, there are millions of us that volunteered to come in and we all have different missions. Most are just simply to hold the frequency just to, because that has the effect of pulling others' frequencies up. So I volunteered and I came in. And um, so I remember that, I do remember that. And I remember hanging around the planet and I had been watching the planet anyway for a long time. And um, we all went through our training and we came in. And, but once I got here, I came in behind the VAL and, and my guys, the one that I called Da, D-A, he's my partner when I'm on that side. And I asked him to keep close tabs on me, to not let me fall into the lower frequency. Don't let me fall into and, and get caught up in the wheel of karma. Don't let me forget who I am. And so, he did a good job of it. He, he stayed with me. He was right there when I, as soon as I was born, he was right there by the crib um, talking to me. Remind, he couldn't tell me who I was or anything like that. Um, as I grew up, what they would do is they would pick me up a lot. They picked me up a lot and they would take me on the ship and they would teach me along with lots of other volunteers and lots of other children and people. They would take us on the ships and they would teach us things. They would teach us our, about our true nature and they, kind of kept nudging me and reminding me that as a human, we are very powerful beings. And so I grew up with that awareness. 
coming because it was taught to me by them. I awakened to the truth of who I was in when I was 37 or 38 when my community had um, a big UFO flat. And I was so blocked against believing in UFOs. I was so blocked that I thought it was all a bunch of silly nonsense. But my girlfriend dragged me to, um, to a press release that the Center for UFO Studies, they were investigating the flap and they, he, she dragged me to this press release where they were talking to the crowd and asking for people, anybody who had experiences to come up and, and you know, share them and all that. And they were showing pictures of, they did had a flip chart thing, a big thing where they had drawn up some of the ships that some local people had seen. And I was getting up to leave because I thought it was just goofy stuff when they flipped it over to this big white orange thing globe that just as it was just like in the movies grant you know <laughs> my head exploded i looked at that and my head exploded i was like holy crap i just saw one of those when was it like two nights ago i for, had totally forgot about it and and it just all came rushing back and i i had was getting up to get out of my seat and i literally fell back into my seat and i just sat there kind of stunned and it all started rushing back and um what I was there for, my girlfriend had dragged me to it because she said that um, she remembered when I was 17 years old and I was on my way to her house and I had lost time. I was supposed to be there at 10 a.m. and I got there at noon, two hours to the minute I was late. And I came in talking about having seen spacemen and the flying saucer and I was excited about it and I wanted her to come back and, and meet them because I really liked them. I wanted her to come back and meet them. And, and she remembered that. And, and I didn't really remember it. It kind of, I kind of sort of remembered a little pieces of it when she talked about it, but I didn't remember it on my own. And so I had started thinking about that right around the same time. It was time for me to wake up and start on my mission, clearly, because I had started thinking about that, that episode too. So she thought I should go there. And I agreed with her that I should go and meet these guys from the Center for UFO Studies and see if I could find a good hypnotist so I could be regressed and, and find out. I was insisting that it was um, some workmen and that they had stopped my, you know, somehow they had stopped my car and I had, I didn't, I never really believed I'd been assaulted or anything like that. I did, but I didn't know what had happened and I was curious about it and it really was bothering me. So I went there and so I connected with Don Schmidt and um, asked him, so it's telling me my internet is good. Are you still okay? Yep, yep, you're um, good. You're still good. Okay. Um, so Don Schmidt was there, and I told him that I saw that orange gold thing, and he was kind. Of, he was mildly interested in that. But when I asked him to, about a hypnotist, he wanted to know why, and I told him, and I told him about when I was 17 and how my car had suddenly stopped running, and I'd stalled. The car stalled and come to a stop, and these four men were in the road, and they all came over and surrounded the car, and that he was interested in and I never could figure out why. Um, he stayed in touch with me and he finally convinced me to, that they would regress me. The Center for UFO Studies would do the regression. It took me a while to let them do that, to agree to that, because I was afraid that they would lead me. I figured since they were investigating UFOs that they would somehow lead me in that way. But he, I, he earned my trust and, and of course they don't. They, they're hoping that that's not what they find but he wanted to give me some peace of mind around it. But I, I was very curious as to why he wanted to be involved. I just, I remember that. I mean, I remember he seemed so intelligent and articulate and I thought it was just the goofiest thing that he was involved with the UFOs and the, and the, um, and the investigation of such things. Cause I thought, you know, he must have a pitiful, boring life, man, that you had to do this. But you know, I, the joke was on me. Um, I mean, I was pretty kind of arrogant, but I had been blocked against, like even when I went to, to when my husband and I went to the movie um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, we went to a drive-in movie to watch it, and the screen was, the you know, it was like it had been cut up into a thousand pieces and put back together all, all out of out of sync. So it was just a big blob of colors up there on the screen. It didn't make any sense to me at all. And the sound was all distorted. I could not make out any of the words being said. I couldn't make out anything. And I was, and I was so mad because my husband was sitting there watching. I said, well, how can you watch that? And I looked around the other cars and everybody was sitting looking at the screen. I'm like, what's wrong with these people? So I, got, I was 
And so I got out of the car because I figured they were all wrong and I was right because I could see everything was goofy. So I got out of the car and I marched into the concession stand. Man, you know, and I walked in there and all huffy and I'm like, how do you expect us to watch that? I fix that so we can watch it. You know, we paid good money to come and see this movie and you can't even see the screen. It doesn't make any sense. The sound, you know, I was just, and there were two teenage boys in there at the concession stand and they looked at each other and like, she's crazy. I saw the look and I was like, uh oh, and they bent down, they looked at the screen and they said, what are you talking about lady? And I bent down and looked out the window. I looked at, and I was like, cause it's all jumbled. Right. And they were like, we don't know what you're talking about, lady. Get out of here. <laughs> kind of, I was embarrassed, but I, I never, I never understood what it was. I went to the car and I crawled in the back seat and I went to sleep because I couldn't, none of it made any sense. So I was very blocked, very, very blocked against anything to do with UFOs or any of that sort of thing. But then once I had the regression, I went down to Chicago and had um, Stanley Mitchell, who was the best regressionist, the best hypnotist. He was president of the National Hypnotic Society or whatever they call their thing. And um, he had developed um, battlefield, battlefield hypnosis so they could do amputations and do surgery in the field. He was good. He was really, yeah, he was good. And I was, I was, I guess, arrogant and uh, cocky or whatever word you want to call it, because I was like, you're not going to be able to do this to me. You know, I'm too strong willed. And it did take him a long time. It wasn't that I didn't want to. It's just that I don't know why I resisted it. I mean, I wanted to find out what happened to me, but there was a part of me that was very resistant. And Don Schmidt was in the room and he had a psychologist in the room with me. And I think there was another guy from the center there and my husband was there and uh, took, took some doing and they were just about to give up on it when, um, when they broke through. And man, it was, it was, I've been regressed since then, but I've never been regressed by anybody like him because I was back there living it. And I know other hypnotists can do that, but nobody's been able to do it with me. Um, that was a fascinating thing because it proved to me that time doesn't exist because I was literally back there reliving it. And what, what fascinated me was um, there were some things that he did, like for instance, what time is it? And I say, well, I, you know, I don't know. And he said, well, look. And so I look at my watch and I tell him what time it was. Or he'd say, he'd say, well, where are you? And I said, well, I'm on highway 92. And he says, is there a crossroad anywhere? And I said, yeah, right up over there. And he said, what's, what road is that? And I said, I don't, I don't know. And he said, was there a sign? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, look at it. So I looked at the sign under hypnosis and I read the sign and I said, oh, it's Tipperary Road. I mean, that fascinates me because when I was really with them back then, I never looked at that road sign. I never looked at my watch. So that's interesting to me. That intrigues me still. So it was hard to deny after I underwent the hypnosis and I remembered he took me through it so, so clearly. I was under for two, over two hours, I think. And he did such a fantastic job. But it just blew my world up that day. I think I was 37 or 38 years old and I was successful as a successful business person and I was confident and I just, I, th I thought I had the world figured out. I was pretty sure of who I was and, and then to find out that these little gray men had come and pulled me out of my car and took me in a spaceship and put me up on the exam table and it just, it just, I just couldn't, I couldn't accept it. I didn't accept it. And I spent the next several years trying to debunk it, trying to find a hole in it, trying to find something else um, that was the reason what really happened. I went to, um, they had the psychologist there and he ran hours and hours of tests on me. And I was counting on him to come up with a diagnosis that I was, something schizophrenic or something or paranoid or something and he didn't and don don was funny that he was don said you know he has the results of your your psychological evaluation and he said you're gonna be very pleased with it he said and i and i said because i don didn't know he, he should have known maybe but i wanted you know a diagnosis i wanted something where i could get some therapy and some pills or something to make me better and 
said, Don said, you know, he said, you know, he said that um, he's never seen anybody with those results. He said, if, um, he said, there's a little bit of paranoia, which he says, actually, that's probably good because of what you've been going through. That you, it's probably shows that you're healthy. But he said, he said, what he said was, if, uh, if there was a way to cheat on that, those tests, he would accuse you of cheating because you're so solid, psychologically sound. And I burst out crying when he told me that. And poor Don, he was like, oh, 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 you know, and he like took me by the shoulders, like, Go, here, come over, talk to Dr. Goodpaster. And I said, yeah, that can't be right. There's something, there's, I mean, I can't be having visits from aliens. That's not the way this world works. And he said, I'm not saying that that's what happened is happening. I'm just saying that, you know, you're as sound as can be. You are not fantasy prone. You are not, you know, all these things. And I was just devastated. I was so disappointed because I had been hoping and hoping beyond hope. So I, I didn't accept that. So I went on and I found a bunch of psychiatrists. I went to a forensic psychiatrist. I went to a bunch of psychologists and another psychiatrist. I think I went to six, all total, six or eight. I can't remember which was hard. You sit down in the office of this doctor who's very together and very, you know, and they're intimidating anyway. And you sit there and they're like, why, okay, you know, what's, why are you here? And you have to open your mouth and say, well, um, they're telling me that I have aliens coming in. They're coming into my home and they're carrying me out into spaceships and that, you know, and I mean, you have to say that to them. I mean, you have to, there's no, there's no shortcut. There's no soft way to say it. You have to just put those words right out there. And once you say the word alien or ET, it's, that's it. But they, every one of them, every one of them, not one of them laughed or thought it was ridiculous. They all said, you know, they all said basically the same thing. There are things in this world that we don't understand and we don't know. And you're not the first one. Most of them, I think almost all of them said, you're not the first one that I've heard this from. And we don't know what it is. You know, I, the guy that I respected the most, he said, um, you know, there's, there's just things we don't understand. It, and it's not all as it seems. This world is not all as it seems to be. That was disappointing, but it was a step I had to take to allow me to start possibly accepting that this was happening to me. But which was good that I was going down that path because then it was, it was happening then in real time. They were coming to the house and I was aware of it. It probably was that I was aware of it because I was open to it now and I wasn't blocked. They couldn't keep me blocked as well. And so I started having open communication with them. They started talking to me and they were concerned about me because I was suicidal, because I was concerned about my children. Um, if it would have been just me, but I, was, I had two children and I felt like I couldn't keep them safe and I felt like I was the lightning rod bringing this to our house. So I, I tried to kill myself one night. And um, <clears throat> so they were concerned about me and they, they did ask me what they could do to comfort me and what could they do to help me. And I thought about that seriously because that was big for them to offer to do something to help me. And they were asking me they weren't telling me it wasn't being dictated. I could tell them what I wanted from them. I could have asked for a lot of different things, you know, um, but I asked for them to show themselves to this meditation group, which had become like a support group. They, they had reached out to me. They heard because it's a small town I live in and they heard through the grapevine that Sherry Wilde was crazy and thought she was having visitors. And, but, oh, but also there were these kids, teenagers were staying at my house and, and they were seeing ETs out on the lawn and they were seeing, so was she crazy or wasn't she, but it was happening. They heard the stories about me and what was going on at my house. And they invited me to join their group. It turns out that their group, they had a person in their group who was a channeler and she had channeled, been channeling for some months that I, that this person was going to show up who was going to need their help and that they were going to need to support me. So they, they knew it was me. So they were told ahead of time about me. So that was done on my behalf. There's a gazillion of those things that have happened in my life. So I was grateful for that. And um, so they invited me into the group and they just were different than the 
UFO groups that I went to where when I would go to those groups, because Don um, had set me up to go to some of those. And at those meetings, people just wanted to hear your story and they wanted to know, which is understandable. Um, and they wanted to know, you know, what did they say and what do they feel like and what do they, all that kind of stuff, the nuts and bolts of it. These guys knew that I had had encounters with aliens and they never once asked, what do they look like? What do they say? And nothing. They just said, well, you must have agreed to have this in your life prior to your birth. Have you ever considered that? And I said, no. And they said, but nothing happens to you without your consent. You know that, don't you? And I said, no, I don't know that. I, I think I'm a victim and certainly my children are victims. And they said, oh, okay, you know, they let it be. But they kept, I was in that group and I, that was huge for me to be in that group. And so I asked when he said, what can we do to comfort you? I said, show yourselves to everyone in that group. And there were a dozen or more. And then I said, oh, and my friend Vicky too, because she'd been the one that I had run to and talked to because no one else would listen to me. My, nobody would listen to me. My husband, my family all shut me out. So Vicky was the one. And um, my sister did kind of for a while, I will say that. Um, but she could only handle very small dosages. So two weeks went by and everybody in the group had a sighting. Everybody in the group, one by one, they all had a sighting and it was fascinating. Some saw a ship in broad daylight. Some saw just dancing lights in the sky. They all saw what they could handle is what I got because there was one guy who didn't get a sighting. And, and I said, why didn't, why didn't Garth see anything? Why didn't he get a sighting? And they showed me his head, just his head. It was the funniest thing. They had just his head there and it was like floating there. And, and there were little spaceships, like a half a dozen of them. And they were floating right in front of his eyes, right in front of his face. And they said, some are not ready. <laughs> That's all that, that was their answer. So everybody saw what they needed to see, and it was, they were all excited. They didn't know. I didn't tell them ahead of time. As a matter of fact, I never told them ever that I had asked that for them. I just never did. They all just thought they had their sightings. Um, and then I remembered one day, at one morning, I think it was morning, um, I was in the kitchen, and I have this in the book, and I was emptying the dishwasher, and, and um, the pipeline opened up, and I heard Da say, so it is good. And I knew he was referring to everybody getting their sighting. And I said, yeah, I said, it was great. I said, everybody, everybody had a sighting. I said, thank you. You know, I, I appreciate that. I said, I feel, I don't know why, but it just made me feel so not alone in my weirdness, you know, to have them all share in it a little bit. And then I remembered Vicky and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He was, and he said, he was closing the pipeline. And I said, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. I said, Vicky didn't get her sighting. And he said, it is done. And I said, no, it's not done. And he said, it is done. And I said, no, it's not done. I said, if she had had a sighting, she would have called me. She never called me. And he said, Sherry, it is done. And I said, just wait right there. Don't you go anywhere. I went to the phone and I called her. And she answered the phone and she had a terrible cold. And she goes, oh, Sherry, oh, I was going to call you as soon as I felt better. She said, you'll never guess what happened. And I was like, oh, geez. So she had her, she did. She had a beautiful sighting of a triangular ship, you know. It kept pace with her car and everything. I was like, okay, you know. So I got off the phone. And so then Di, he goes, it is done. And I said, oh, it is good. He said, it is good. And I said, yeah, it's good. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know why I got mad, but I did. <laughs> he was right. But anyway, so goes my life. Um, so from there um, came the recession. My marriage came undone. Life changed a lot after that. Um, well, actually then, wait a minute, my marriage came undone and then I had, um, I had a reprieve, that's right. I was 37, 38, almost 39 years old. My marriage ended when I was 39 or 40. And I had a nice 20 year reprieve. I was supposed to go, I was supposed to leave then this isn't in the book. I don't know if I've even said this publicly. I think I might have once before. I was supposed to leave when I was 41. Would have been 1991, so I've been 40. They wanted me. They wanted me up on the ship, 
and they said you can be of more value here and your t your contract is fulfilled your mission you know is fulfilled and i said i said um no i'm not i'm not leaving I was supposed to go out on a car accident and it'd be a car accident. And if you read my book, in my book, I have in there how for a long period of time right in through here, when I would pull out of an intersection or something, I would hear a crashing sound. Like I was just jumpy as all get out when I was driving for about, I guess, I don't know, four, six months. I don't know. I remember my mom being with me. She said, what's wrong with you? And I said, I'm just... I said, I just feel like I'm going to have an accident or something. I said, I'm double careful when I pull in intersections. And I did. I had some close, I had one for sure at that time where this big, I think it was a Chrysler or a Buick was coming at me, this beige colored car. And it went right through me. It was going to T-bone me right in the intersection. But it went right through. Just was the most amazing thing. And um, what happened was I was supposed to, die in a car accident at that time that I had an out then that was one of my outs that I had is we all have exits at different points and that was one of them they wanted me to take it I had the option whether to or not and I said no I'm not going to take it they argued with me and they came to my house um three from the council came and met with me yeah and they leaned on me to leave and they really really want me and they said it's going to get really bad you don't want to stay you don't want to stay and I said I'm not leaving my children you think I'm going to leave my children? You just told me it's going to get really bad. And they said, it's going to get really bad for you. And you, you, you don't want to stay. And I said, I'm not leaving my children. And they, well, I remember one of them leaned in really close to me and said, um, happens all the time. You know, meaning children are left. You know, the mother dies. And I said, I don't care. It's not happening to my children. And he said, what makes you think it's not in their best interest? How did you put it? What makes you think it is, to, it is not to their detriment for you to stay? I think that's how he said it. What makes you think it is not to their detriment for you to stay? And I said, I'm their mother. I said, I can't believe you just said that. I said, I'm not going. And that was the end of it. And so I stayed. I should have probably left. <laughs> probably, neither of my children talked to me. So um, I'm such a huge embarrassment to them. So um, I stayed and I had, a, and here's the deal we cut. I stayed and for 20 years, I would not, I would have visits from them, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be aware of them. And I wouldn't have very much interference at all. They would mostly be watching me. And I would have 20 years to live kind of a normal life. But then I was going to be expected to kick back in again and take on a really difficult mission. So I agreed to it. And so I had 20 years, best years of my life. I just loved that time. Um, it was from the time I was 40 until I was 60. In 2009, the recession hit. And my life came totally unraveled. Uh, within, I mean, it just went from living the dream. I was having such a great time. I was just living the dream. I was very successful, very financially successful had become a, a multimillionaire and so I traveled a lot and I had a company that was doing really great. I was doing what I loved to do. I was doing some big developments, which really got me excited because I loved creating home sites and I was building houses and I was refurbishing, I was doing commercial properties, refurbishing them. And I just was having fun, just rolling along with a great life. And it just hit the wall. Like just one day, the lights went out. It's it, the business just stopped. The real estate just stopped, which would have been fine. I wasn't worried about that. I, I looked at it. I thought, well, I'm due for a vacation. I was doing two big developments, but I had to put the brakes on those. We were just ready to start construction on the one. And um, it's like, okay. But then my brother died suddenly, just collapsed at the airport and passed away very quickly. And my mom, a few months later, my dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and I lost him to Alzheimer's. Um, my sister got a bad diagnosis um, and my older brother disowned me. And my two daughters disowned me. And my bank failed. And when they went down, I, I, the feds came in and they would not let me move my accounts to another bank. I had another bank who wanted to take it, take my accounts and they wouldn't let me. They forced me into bankruptcy. They devalued my properties. 
they devalued them $3 million. They just said, oh, this property was worth 2.1 million. No, 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 that's only worth 248,000 now. And, and they devalued another one. I mean, they just devalued all my properties and said, oh, geez, look at that, you're upside down, you're underwater, we're gonna take them away from you. So they took away all my properties, took away everything. I'm 60 years old and they left me with nothing. It just was, you know, everything was everything. I lost everything, including I felt like I lost my identity. Um, I was felt pretty much alone, and um, so I got the message to go to the desert, and so I did. My parents had a condo down there, and so I went down with my dad. My mom had passed, and I went down, took my dad down there, and stayed with him because he couldn't be alone anyway with the with the Alzheimer's. He was early stages, but he was failing pretty fast. And when I was down there, I came to is the only way I know how to do it. I don't know what I was doing before this. I can't remember before this. I thought I was in bed sleeping. I must have gotten up and gotten dressed, showered, and because all of a sudden it was morning and I was I came to I like I woke up and I was sitting at my on my laptop typing. And they had told me to write a book and I had agreed to it initially because it sounded like a good idea to write a book. But then I thought about it and I thought, I don't want to write a book and out myself. So I said, no, or I didn't even say no. I just said, I just said to myself, no, I'm not going to do it. So there I am now clicking away on the laptop and I wake up and I look at the screen and I'm like, what am I doing? What am I doing? And it was the weirdest thing to just wake up hit, typing like that. And I looked at the screen and I read the last couple of lines of what I had written. And I just said, oh, no, 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 I'm not writing this. And he goes, it is time. And I said, it is not, I, I do mock him a lot. I said, it is not time. I said, I'm not writing your damn book. And he goes, it is time. And I said, no, I'm not writing it. And he just was quiet. And I thought, I wonder what it says. It was a page, and I went back a page, and I went back, it was three pages. And I read it. And by the time I got to the third page, I was like, damn, that's good. <laughs> it's like, that's my life. And it's, it's answering questions that I had had. It was filling in some blanks that, you know, I, I had memories here and memories there, but they were, as it was being written, it was filling in and connecting the dots. And I, so I said, okay, I'll write the book only because I want to, this is my life. I want to, I want to know, I want to get all that. I want to get the blanks filled in. I mean, I'm, I was curious about all that. So I said, okay, I'll write the book. And beside, and I, so I sat there and it was a collaborative effort. It was between them and me. It was interesting. I felt like I was writing it, but there was like flashes of insight that would come, that was definitely coming from them. And then the, also they were giving me words when I would, um, the first first thing I do every morning is do my Course in Miracles. Back then I was doing Course in Miracles. And um, so I would get up and I would read whatever part, wherever I was in the book from the Course in Miracles. And then I would meditate and do my prayer and, and gratefulness and all that. And sometimes when I would read it, I ended up getting a notebook because they would say, they would highlight the word. And they still do that to this day. They highlight it like it's highlighted. It's in bold or it's in the yellow. It's actually highlighted. And they, they'll go, take that word write that word down, Sherry, remember that word, you're going to need it later. So I would write it down. Sometimes I knew the meaning, sometimes not. And so I'd look up the meaning of it. And sure enough, later I'd be writing and I'd need that word. It was a word that I wouldn't normally have used, but they wanted that word as a descriptive word for what I was writing. So it was interesting writing that book. And I was, I, I read it, I wrote, I, I would read it at the end of the day. I would sat down every day, every day I wrote for four to eight hours a day. And I take breaks and go walk in the desert and then come back and write some more. And it was just opening up and it was coming clear. And I was conversing with my guys all the time. I'd go for walks in the desert and I would talk to them. And I would ask questions about what happened. And I would, and I asked questions about, you know, why, why are you in my life so much? You know, why you come for me so much? Cause I, I don't think you, you don't show up for people that much from what I had understood from talking to other abductees you know sometimes it's only a couple times or whatever or, or maybe it's periodically or whatever but they're there sometimes three four five times a week they were sometimes and I say why are you hanging around why are you picking me up so much and they said well because you have a mission to do and you know 
you're one of us and and we we want to keep you close by we don't want any harm to come to you and blah, blah, blah. it's like okay and so i started to, i referred to myself in the book as a participant in a program because that's what i that was the title i gave myself a participant in a program it was only later that i found out about Dolores Cannon and she used the word volunteer, which is a much easier way of saying a participant in a program. I'm a volunteer. And um, that was huge the day that um, I discovered Dolores Cannon. A friend sent me a link to one of her, it was after the book had been written, and sent me a link to one of her in, um, interviews and um, talks and I just sobbed all the way through it because she was, she was like she was talking about me and she was, she was telling me there were others like me and i didn't feel so alone you know because i he they kept talking about this mission and i i didn't know what i was what was in store for me i thought it was just writing the book you know and um so dolores cannon ended up being the um the, the uh, publisher of the book but it didn't come easy i'll tell you the way that it went I came back from Arizona to Wisconsin with the book on my computer and I printed it off and I put it in a box in the basement and then I put it on a, on a little thumb drive. And then I went, I tried to go back to my life. I tried to rebuild my life. I tried to put back the pieces. I tried to, um, you know, get my business resurrected. I tried to starting from scratch all over, you know, at 60 or 61 years old. And, um, I went, I was starting to get sick and I went to see my Reiki guy. He was great. He was a Pleiadian. The first time I met him, I was directed to go see this guy, Will. That's another, I mean, they tell, I mean, my life is totally controlled. Go see Will. And so I go to see this guy named Will and he's great Reiki. And I look at him and I'm like, oh, I look at him and I blurt out and I say, you know, you're a Pleiadian, right? And he goes, yeah. And I'm like, good, because I probably shouldn't have said that, but you know, it's, I feel like, you know, you must know that you're Pleiadian. You see, yeah, I came here, I'm a healer and he's a great guy. And um, I really like him and he was my Reiki guy and he would do Reiki and he would always afterwards tell me how he loved it. It was an honor to do that for me because he, the room would always fill up with ETs. He said it was always so cool because I would always, the room would be filled with all these ETs and they'd talk while they were working on me. And it's true that, when I'd go in for Reiki, many times I'd open my eyes because I'd be like, okay, I got hands on my head, I got hands on my shoulder, I got hands, I got at least six pairs of hands on me, how can that be? And I'd open my eyes, he'd be down on my feet and there's like hands. So I'd be like, kind of kind of creeped out, but I, it felt, you know, I, that's okay, I guess. So this time I went to work with him, have him work on me and um, we get done. And afterwards he's, his eyes were all sparkly. And I was like, okay, something good happened this time. I said, tell me about, you know, what happened this time in the room. And he said, this was pretty special, Sherry. And I said, well, what, what, what happened? Who showed up? And he said, well, angels. He said, it was a room full of angels. He said, there were two ETs here, but the rest were all angels. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, but there was a special angel here. And I said, what's that? And he said, standing right up by your left shoulder was this, larger angel and so i i said to everybody okay before we get started let's introduce ourselves so we went around the table and we got to that bigger angel um he introduced himself as arcane as as gabriel gabriel and will said to him you wouldn't happen to be archangel gabriel and as an answer he started to unfurl his large wings and he said no 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 don't don't need to do that and he said you know but welcome you're thank you know thank you for being here and Archangel Gabriel started talking to him and he said, um, Sherry has written a book and Will looked at me and he said, did you write a book? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, Archangel Gabriel showed up because he has a message for you. You're supposed to get the book published. And I said, are you freaking kidding me? Are you kidding? The ETs are talking to the angels and they're ganging up on me? You're kidding. And he's like, no, he's serious. You've got to get it published. He said, you have to publish it. It's important. And I said, it's just a little book. It's just a story about my life. And he said, it's going to be made into a movie. That's what they said. And you're supposed to travel the world and you're supposed to speak about it. It's supposed to, it's going to have a huge impact. And I said, that can't be. I said, it's just a little book. 
And he said, you're supposed to get it published, Sherry. And I said, do you believe in archangels? And he said, I do now. He said, well, but yeah, he said, I, I, I've always believed in them. And I said, I don't know if I do or not. And he said, they're real, Sherry. He was here. So I came home and I Googled Archangel Gabriel. Well, it turns out Archangel Gabriel is the angel of, of communication and that oversees the publication of books, among other things. That kind of scared me a little bit. That was so... I felt like I didn't have any choice. So I got the book out and I called my girlfriend who knew about how to get books published. And I asked her how you get a book published. And she, and then I Googled that. How do you publish a book? She said, you have to write a, 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 a thing. I forget what you call it, but, and then you get this book that tells who the publishers are and who takes that genre of book and all that. So I went to Barnes and Noble the next day or so. It didn't take me long. I went up and, and went to Barnes and Noble. I walked in, and you know, I walked in, and I walked right straight down this aisle, and I walked right straight to the book. It was right there, big thick book that has a list of all the publishers. And I bought that book and brought it home, and I found like five or six publishers who published crazy books about UFOs, you know, and ETs and all that. And so I, I just did it. I googled how to write the cover letter, and you, you apply and you do, I don't know. Anyway, I sent it off to him. Two of the publishers were out of business. A publisher, a husband and wife team took it first. They were lovely, wonderful people. They were really nice people. Um, they're publishers for, um, um, let me think what her name is, in the Australia. Um, she, she has a book about her ET encounters. Why can't I think of her name? Um, anyway. They were going to publish my book, and they were wonderful to work with. But then Dolores Cannon got a hold of me. She had finally gotten around to reading my book, and she wanted to publish it. And I got pushed really hard to, that she was the one I was supposed to go with. I didn't want to do that to the other people, but they understood. They were very gracious about it, and they said, if that's who you're meant to go with, that's who you're meant to go with. But they served a purpose, you know. Um, the first publishers, he talked about, he wanted me to put more spiritual stuff in it toward the end, which I did. And he's the one who also asked me, um, he told me that Da describes himself, I described him as, an, as a gray, I do, I described him as a gray, as, um, as um, um, Zetas in the book, because that's what they look like. And so I thought that's what they were. But then this guy was the first one. He said, well, but they tell you that they're from, um, from Andromeda. And I said, yeah. And he said, they can't be from Andromeda and be Zetas. And I said, why not? I mean, because I didn't know that stuff. And he said, because if they're Zetas, they come from Zeta Reticuli. I said, well, I don't know. I said, I only know what I know. And I said, they look like Zetas, so I assume that's what they were. But you're right. You know, they did tell me they're from Andromeda. And he said, well, he said, find out who they are, what they are. And I said, how am I going to do that? And he said, well, ask them. So the next time I saw him, I did. I said, my publisher wants to know, are you a Zeta? Are you a, what are you? Are you a gray? And Da looks at me and kind of, that would not best describe the truth of who I am. And I said, okay, well then who are you? Where are you from? And that's when he said, you know, I am a voyager of the universe going where needed in service to the creator. And I said, oh, okay. And then I said, um, but you look like a gray. You know, you look like a gray. And he goes, well, that's, that's a, a suit that we put on when we come into your density to work in your world. We have to have a body to do the work that we do. He said, I am what you call an etheric being. And I said, okay, I knew, I kind of knew that because I've seen him in his theory. I've seen him in that state. And um, so that was interesting that um, that publisher was able to get me to do that and talk to them about that. And I enjoyed that. Then I had a, um, I had an interview. I told this story once in an interview with, um, I'm not going to remember his name now either. I'm getting old. Um, anyway, and it, he said, this interviewer, he said, um, why do they pick a Zeta suit? Why don't they pick a human suit so that they don't scare you so much and scare other people so much? And I said, that's a good question. I don't know. And he said, why don't you ask them? And I said, okay, I'm gonna. 
So I did like that night. They came that night because I, as I was on, the, as I was telling the interview, they were outside the window in the ship. And I was watching them, and so they were there that night. And so I said to them, you know, they won't, here's a question for you: Why don't you come in in a human body? He said, oh, the human body is complicated, and, and, and the Zeta body is is um, much more functional. I think is the word he used: functional or durable or something. And um, I said, well, if you came in in a human body, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be so scary to, all, to us. And he said, so you think I'm scary, huh? And I said, yeah, you're, you're scary. You know you scare me every time because you wipe my memory clean. So every time I see you again, then I'm scared. And he goes, well, you know, you're pretty scary too. You humans, you know, you scare us a lot. And I said, excuse me? And he said, yeah, when you do that thing that you call smile, we think you're going to eat us. He said, all those teeth coming at us. And I was like, okay, gotcha. So, so that's that little exchange. Anyway, I'll move on here. Um, so the book got published and um, I got sick. I got poisoned um, almost immediately. And they um, came in and did a full on attack. They um, hit me with elf radiation. They like to tell you what they're doing to you so you know. So they hit me with elf radiation that um, suppressed my immune system and brought my frequency way down. Because my frequency was so was high, I really couldn't get sick. But the poison and the elf radiation, and then they did mind control. They did, they put something in my head. It, Can I ask who did that? that? Was called a, that's a very good question, Grant. Um, I would tell you that the Draco were here, but I do not believe it was the, I mean, it, it, it may have been involving the Draco, but there were also these military type, uniform type people, but there were Draco as well. But I, I, have a, I actually have a soft spot for the Draco. I, I mean, I don't have any fear of them. I don't know why, maybe that's brainwashing, maybe that's, I don't know. But I don't sense that it was really the, the Draco. But they put in this thing called um, called a Trojan horse implant, and it it took it took over my thoughts. Plus, I had the voice of I think it's the like they I would hear voices other, other than that. I don't know if it came from the Trojan horse implant. I think the Trojan horse implant was just because my as soon as it would go in, it would come out. I had blood on my pillow. I mean, they, they were there. I felt like a ping pong. You know, they were putting in. Somebody else come in and take it out. Somebody was coming and they were giving us amino acid shots. They were trying to help us with our health. So I had the good guys, I had the bad guys, and it was like a tug of war with me. And it was just horrible. I can't tell you what a nightmare it was. It was just crazy city here at my house. Just crazy. It was awful. And um, they indoctrinated my partner, Jim, into... Um, the whole thing, he had had his own encounters and um, he got picked up by the Draco one night, but it seemed to be a friendly meeting. Um, it was just crazy. There were ships, there were people in my house. There have been people, I mean, I finally think I had my house secure. I got fed up with it all. Um, I banished everyone, but the thing about banishing everyone and telling them that they're not welcome here is that the good guys listen to you and they leave, but the bad guys don't. They keep coming anyway. And I made a mistake when I did that because they were coming in and they were giving me amino acid sh shots and they were helping me with my health. They were giving me Reiki. Us Reiki, they were doing a lot of healing stuff on us. And when I told everybody to get the hell out and everyone just leave us alone, the bad guys continued to come. And it got really bad. Um, I've got my house pretty well protected now. But I, it's a confusing time um, for the for the series. My producers, my producer wants me to write write out, and I'd like to write a book about what I went through um, with these attacks. But I'm number one. I'm too sick. But number two is I don't want to relive it again. And it's very confusing because where the, the way they attacked me was my, you know, my, my brain, you know, I mean, the poison that I had mercury poison and then iron, iron poison, um, heavy, heavy metals. 
and um, ended up in the hospital with it, and it was deathly. So there's a lot of confusion. I tried to, I was out on the circuit trying to give lectures because I knew that that's what I was supposed to do, and I had booked so many talks, Contact in the Desert and some of those, and I went to those. I don't know how I got through the talks. I do not know. There were some things I went to that I, there was a thing in Canada that I can't even remember being at. I was at that, yeah. It that was, was in Toronto. Crazy. I thought you lectured. There's, you were pretty sick then, I remember that. I was very sick. And people would see, I used to get reports after I would get off, get done with my talk. I don't know if you were there when um, people would, people would come to me afterwards and they'd say, you had two ETs jump out of your belly after you were done talking. Do you know that? <laughs> and they went, and I, I would see people run. I saw this guy get up and run out of the room, literally run. He came back later and he said, never seen anything like that. He said, you had an ET in you. He said it came out of you after you get done with your lecture. So they were literally taking over my body, I think, so that I could give the talk. But I was, you know, to fly to these lectures, I was very sick. My ankles were like swollen to three times the size. I was really, I didn't realize how sick I was, you know. And so in 2015, the attacks started. Sure. Oh, yeah, go ahead. May I ask a question just before you move on? You mentioned that now your house, your house is pretty well protected. How was it protected? Mm -hmm. How have you managed to do that? Um, Sasha Stone recommended something called a 5G bio shield that comes out of Russia. I have three of them in my house, and we've noticed a big difference. We don't hear the footstep. We don't hear people walking around in the house as much. We're not seeing um, anything except what we feel are positive entities. I still get, I mean, every night at 6.30, 7 o'clock, I get over in my dining room, I get, I would get at least a dozen ETs. It's like a gathering place or something. I don't mind the positive ones. And the positive ones can still come and they're very welcome here, but the negative can't get through that. high. It's a high frequency shield. It creates a dome over your house. And it's called a 5G bio shield and you know you hear about these things you don't know what's real and what's not but i trust sasha and i have to say we've got three of them up here and jim and i both notice otherwise we hear what's we would wake up and that there's stuff happening here that you know we had the car the black car parked a black pickup truck actually parked down at the end of the driveway for every every night you know for two weeks my neighbor told me about it she's like you know you got somebody like stalking you or something because they're just sitting at the end of your driveway. You know, it's just creepy stuff. You know, people, just stuff happening. Not happening as much anymore. And I think the frequency, you know, so we're, we're fighting back as best we can. So um, what was I saying? Something about, what was I, where was I going? Um, you mentioned something about to, uh, 2015. You're moving forward to 2015. Oh yeah, 2015. Um, yeah, because the attacks started in, um, as soon as the book was written, really very slowly. But then as soon as I went start lecturing, started going on lectures, they started attacking me. And so 2015, I had exits coming up, and I knew it. I don't know how I knew it, but I knew it. And so I went before the council in, I think it was late January or February, March, somewhere into there. I went in, and I, I asked if I could leave. And um, it was an, I had to give, it was a pretty good argument I gave to them before they finally agreed that I could leave. And I had an exit coming up in September of 2015. And I was very happy to take that, very excited to be leaving and going home because I was really suffering and um, I didn't, I was no good. I couldn't go out and speak publicly. Every time I agree to give, an interview like this, I do get, I do get attacked. I get, I get, I get sicker. I always do. I pay when I do an interview like this, and I've been deathly sick the last two days. Really, really, really sick. I don't know how they do that. I've been hit with, um, what do they call those directed energy weapons? I've been hit with those. They come in. Those almost one almost. It was going. I've been hit twice. The one almost killed me, and then I heard them say, "We've got you." It was strangling my heart. I could hardly breathe. It came in, I thought it was a bullet. It came in so sharp right into my side. But anyway, 2015, I was gonna leave. And um, September, 
I don't know how I was going to die. I didn't care. I just wanted out. A week. It must have been only a week. It couldn't have been more than that. Maybe two weeks. I was, um, I was happy. I was leaving. I was trying to find a way to meet with my daughters and let them know, even though they weren't talking to me. I thought I should let them know that I was going to be going. And I was planning to have a little gathering with close friends and family before I left. And I was making those plans when I got an email from, um, that's back when I was still on, on Facebook, which I still have my page up. I got to take that down. I, had, I never go on there. I was on Facebook and um, Anelia Benz, if you know her, she's a spiritual teacher. She reached out to me and she said, you know, I need to talk to you. Um, and you need to come, you need to come to me. You need to come here to me. She lives in the state of Washington. She said, I need to, to meet with you. And I said, I, I'm too sick. I mean, but I loved her. I've been a big, huge fan of hers, and I follow her. I thought she was just a, a remarkable person. And I always said, there's only two people in this world that I would walk across the street or fly to the other side of the planet to meet with Eckhart Tolle and Anelia Benz. So, I mean, that was for her to invite me. I, I just, so Jim was the one. He said, you know, Sherry, you can stay here and sit on the sofa and suffer, or, or I can, I'll take you to the airport. You know, you can get on the plane. You can fly out there, you know, go out and see what she has to say. You know, and so I just, I said yes, and I just, and I went, but boy, got out there, and um, she picked me up at the airport, her and her, and her um, Larry, her fiance, and her husband, or whatever he is, and um, first thing she says to me when we get back to her place, she says, so, I understand you're planning to leave the planet, and I said, and she puts it just the way that I think of it too. You know, I don't think of it as, I never just call it dying. I just call it leaving the planet. And, she, and I was like, how did you know that? And she goes, I was contacted by your family, your ET family, all three of them. She said, you're working with three groups. And I said, yeah. And she said, well, they reached out to me. And she said, let me tell you, she said, they, they reached out one by one. She said, first your group, you know, da, they reached out and they said, we can't reach her. She's been so messed with we can't get to her we can't communicate with her anymore will you please talk to her and tell her not to leave she can't leave she, she has a mission she needs to finish and she said no sorry i'm here for the collective i don't do individual things like that she said and i heard from the second group and the third group she said, i told them all the same thing no i'm here for the collective i don't convey personal messages like that she said then i heard from your soul family and they said please reach out to sherry she will be so disappointed if she leaves the planet at this time and doesn't finish her mission. She will be so disappointed. And she said, I told them, no, I'm here for the collective. And I said, whoa, hard hearted lady there. And she's like, well, I'm here for the collective. You know, I can't be doing, if I start doing that, she said, I'll be spending all my time just taking care of these individual messages and I can't do it. She said, but then Mother Earth reached out to me and she said, you must get a hold of Sherry. She is one of my biggest, um, Champions, I think is the word she used. And she said, she, she needs to stay. She can't, she can't leave. I know she wants to leave, but please convince her to, you know, or not. No, it wasn't ask her to stay. It was never convince her, make that clear. Anelia was never asked to convince me. She never did try to convince me. She just put before me these messages. You are being asked to reconsider and to stay. And so she told me that and I started to cry because that, I could not believe that. I mean, that was very touching. And um, I said, but why, why? I said, why am I supposed to stay? What, I don't understand. I said, I'm, I'm from Wisconsin. I'm a small town girl. I just, I'm a nobody. I said, it's just a little book. I said, I don't get it. And she said, Apparent, she said apparently not. She said, apparently the book is, is going out. She said, they showed me like a still lake with a pebble being dropped in it and the waves just go out and out and out and out. And she said, but also it's going to be made into a movie. And I said, oh, that again. I said, I've been hearing that. And she said, I guess it won't happen if, you, if, you're, if you're dead. And I said, well, probably not, you know, but maybe. And she said, not as likely. So she said, I think they want you to stay for that. And I said, okay. And I said, and the other I said, would you stay if you were me? And she said, oh, if I were you, I would have been gone a long time ago. <laughs> she said, I look at your life. And she said, I look at the suffering. And she said, I look at what you're, no, she said, I would have been gone a long time ago. And I said, 
well, can you look down the road and can you tell me, am I going to continue to suffer like this? And so she looked at it and she made a face and she said, it's okay. It gets, it gets better. And I said, okay, really? Um, she said, just think about it. She said, it's totally, she said, I'm not trying to convince you of anything. She said, it's your call. I'm just giving you their messages and they're asking you to reconsider. The one that got to me was my soul family saying that I would regret it. They said she fought so hard to come onto the planet. We were opposed to her going in and doing that mission because it was a, she took on a lot. But we know her and we know that she would be very disappointed if she left and prematurely. And I thought, well, if, you know, if anybody knows me, they do. And so I did reconsider and so I, I canceled the exit. I have had many times when I have regretted that. Many, many times. Just two days ago, I re I was saying, I wish to hell I never would have done that, because I can't get a can I can't get an exit now. I've asked just recently. I asked, and I got a snide answer from my guys telling me that, no, you have no exit. You not you can't leave now. And I said, and if I well, I won't go into that. I suppose on this, but. You know, I say, you can't make me stay kind of thing. And they're like, just try to leave. So I told Jim, I said, you know, what, what are they going to do? But they've done, they have managed in the past. I mean, there was another time when I was going to die. I was going to, I told Jim to leave and, and to just let me lay in the bed. I was dying. I could tell I was dying. And, and I had to fight with him, but he knew how sick I'd been. And he, he finally did leave. I said, just send somebody back in two or three days, pick up the body and let me just die. But I'm laying there in the bed, you know, and Jim hasn't been gone for five minutes, and, and uh, this big booming voice goes, so that's it, Sherry, you're just going to lay there and let yourself die? And I was like, as a matter of fact, I am. And they're like, um, aren't you even curious about what it is that's, that's uh, causing you such distress or something, well, however they put it? They didn't say dying. They just said, what's causing you to be so sick or something? And I said, I'm in heart failure. I said, you know, I, I knew what heart failure was. My daughter had had it. My mother had had it. So I'm in heart failure, and I worked in a hospital, and I said, I'm going to die of heart failure. I said, my heart will just stop beating finally. And I said, right? And there was no answer. And I lifted up. I was really, really weak. I lifted my head up, and I said, it's heart failure, right? And there was no answer. And I was like, God damn it, it is heart failure, right? I'm going to die. I'm not going to just, like become like a, like paralyzed or, you know, stuck in a body that, you know, that would be worse is to have me all but die, you know, stay on in a body that couldn't move or something. I, so I started to think about it and I thought, what if I'm wrong? What if I just have this huge stroke and I can't move, but I'm still stuck here, you know? And um, so I started to get worried. So then I grabbed my phone and I called Jim and I said, come back and get me. To, you know, he had wanted to take me to the ER. I said, come back and take, take me to the ER. So we did. And we went up there and, um, <laughs> and I went in and I told the doctors, I said, I'm in heart failure. <laughs> I said, I'm in heart failure or something like that. I said, but I said, here's the thing. Here's the deal. I said, I just want you to confirm that I'm in heart failure and then I'm going home to die. I said, I don't want you do you. I said, you, you do not save my life. And Jim was embarrassed. He's like, don't pay any attention to her. She's crazy. But I just, I just want confirmation. Well, it turns out it was poison, the poison. And when I had been out to see Anelia, that was the first that I had heard about. She said, you know, they want to, they mean to kill you. She said that sentence. She said to me, you know, they mean to kill you. And I said, what? And she said, they mean to kill you. And I said, who means to kill me? And she said, the dark ones. And I said, who's that? And she said, the ones who are attacking you. And I said, so I'm, I am under attack. You know, I had thought. It was something like that, but I wasn't really, I'm so naive, you know, I didn't believe that such evil existed. I didn't know really what was going on. It was all so confusing, you know, but then after that is when they start telling me we're hitting you with elf radiation, you know, and the Trojan horse implant. And so it was all very weird times, very weird times. So that was um, 2015, 16. Now, 2020, I believe that it may be my destiny to be healed. 
I want to believe that it is my destiny to be healed. Um, I don't know. I'm pretty sick. It's sometimes it's hard to believe you can come back from something like this, but I'm working on it. It's the first time that I've tried really hard because before I could not focus very well. 